Hi, this is Derek Carp, the founder and chairman of CSA and the host of the CSA podcast show. And uh, if you've tuned in before, we've been doing a series of interviews with some amazing cybersecurity uh, leaders in, in industry um, across lots of different parts of the industry, uh, different sectors. But there's uh, some common truths about their journeys and they're sharing those stories. And today I have an amazing uh, guest. Mark Weatherford, the CSO at Alert Enterprise and the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center. Uh, Mark is not just a security uh, leader, well-known, established security leader in the space, but he's a husband, a father, he's a military veteran after a, a distinguished career in the military, he's a technologist, but he's other things too. He's a well-rounded individual, he's a beekeeper, he's soon to be a rancher and a gardener uh, on the side. He's an outdoorsman, a hunter, a pilot, he's a well-rounded man, who does a lot of different interesting things, and I'm really excited that he uh, had the time to come on and share a story with us today. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks, Derek. I'm happy to be here. Mark, I sort of start this, uh, it's always the same way with the same sort of shtick, which is, you know, modern day superheroes, cybersecurity people are, are a kind of modern day superhero, and they all superheroes have a backstory. So let's sort of start with yours, you know, where you where you grew up. Well, I grew up in uh, in a in a farming community, an agricultural community in Northern California, about 50 miles north of Sacramento, and it's literally there's no real industry there. It's all agriculture, you know, whether it's peaches or pears or plums or rice or cattle or sheep. That's kind of I grew up on on the farm basically and involved with, you know, pretty much all different aspects of of agriculture. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I was looking at all your sort of professional pursuits, but if you go back far enough, there is agriculture is where you start doing, you know, rolling up your sleeves and doing some work as a young person. Yep, for sure. Very early, by the way. Um, <laughs> I think I, I really started working ranching when I was like 12 years old. In the story arc, you're going back to some of this you know, <laughs> chapter. You're going back to the way it was. Yeah. That's kind of always been my plan, you know. I mean, I, I I left it obviously, you know, to to be spend a career in the Navy and then, you know, be a technologist traveling around the world and, and you know helping companies in the cyberspace. But I kind of always planned to be back there in, you know, uh, in the ranch uh, uh, game. Yeah. Well, awesome. Um, let's let's talk about then um, when you know when technology. It, you know, I, I know, you know, prior to the Navy, does technology intersect or, or even cybersecurity intersect with your life? You know, I ask everybody that and it's it's very, very different. Some people say, here's where it entered my career path uh, really early for some, really, really late for others. Well, I, the only thing that I can think of, you know, from a really kind of a technological perspective is, you know, I was always goofing around with electricity. I was always wiring up motors and lights and things. And the thing that sticks out in my head is, I must have blown the breakers in my house a thousand times when I was a kid because, you know, I would would touch, you know, I would overload a circuit or I would touch wires together. And uh, so that was kind of my although and I had no intention of, of going into the technology business when I went in the Navy. In fact, when I went in the Navy, I, I enlisted before I got commissioned. But when I went in the Navy, my whole goal was to be a CB and drive tractors and build bridges. And they said, no, we think you should go in this other area, you know, and get in this electronics field. And, and I, you know, at the time, I wasn't crazy about it because I really had my heart set on being a CB. But anyway, you know, in the long run, it ended up working out pretty good. I can't complain about it. Well, that let's let's talk about that, that journey. So you uh, you finish high school and you, you enlist and you go where do they where do you go first? Again, interestingly. I went to school. I, I was a, a, an electronics maintenance guy, I was, it, but I worked on uh, you being a, a former Navy guy yourself. I was a, a cryptologic technician, so I was really focused on kind of signals intelligence stuff. So I I worked on this one equipment, one piece of equipment, and the Navy had just implemented this a big computer system. It was actually a mini computer at the time. You know, it was like I don't know it took up a whole room, but. Yeah. I learned how to maintain this thing, you know, how to take care of it. I had to learn to code. I had to learn to troubleshoot. I had to learn to operate. And, you know, so the, my first two years in the Navy was just going to school and learning how to do all of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah, it's funny. I think you're describing that computer and it's like now our the, the, the you know, the, the phone in our hands is more powerful than the way. 
cutting edge way more powerful. <laughs> yeah. and, and more importantly, much more reliable. Yeah, yeah. I worked with CTs. Uh, I, I got the the honor, the dubious honor of being uh, labeled, named the CMS custodian on one of my, my very oh. first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got there and of course there were people putting the fear God in me like, yeah, you screw this up and you're done. You know, <laughs> <I'm> like, uh, <laughs> you know, brand new uh, to the Navy, you know, minted. Uh, yeah. In, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Whenever but, you're an ensign, they always, they always take advantages of new ensigns by making them the CMS custodian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you lose any of this or anybody working with you loses any of this, you're doomed. <laughs> you're going to jail for the rest of your life. Yeah. 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 So, OK. So that's obviously where technology takes a, a, a huge, you know, it merges or you merge into that path and, and you really never leave it again. I, I don't think. Right. No. So after I got commissioned, uh, I went to in, interesting and long story, but I, I went to Keflavik, Iceland. That was my first duty station after getting commissioned. And uh, and it's a, a two and a half year tour there. Some things happened and my, my commanding officer, we ended up firing his executive officer. And he said, he kind of came to me and he said, hey, if you will extend and stay one more year uh, um, and be my executive officer, We'll give you whatever you want. I've already talked to the detailer. You can get whatever you want after Iceland. So I decided to do it. So I spent three and a half years in Iceland. Uh, but then my my choice after that was to go to grad school. In graduate school, um, I it was a it, the program. It was at the Naval Postgraduate School. The the program was called Information Technology Management, and it was this was ninety three ninety four time frame. And they had just created this program as essentially an MBA with um, with a technology focus. Everybody at, at the Naval Postgraduate School has to write a thesis, you know, to graduate. So I wrote my thesis on information security. And um, remember, this is so 1994. This is pre Google, pre World Wide Web. Or World Wide Web was just coming out. America and, online. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, mosaic, by the way. Yes, um, yes, right. But uh, but so I wrote my ended up I wrote my thesis on information security, and you know information security was not a big topic back then. Um, there weren't a lot of people doing information security, but it just it was it was something that I kind of gravitated to. It took a couple of classes that said you know kind of pointed me in that direction, and you know that that changed my life. You know, I kind of I wrote a thesis and. You know, a few people in the Navy thought, wow, this is kind of interesting, which led to really kind of a good job for a junior officer after grad school. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of set the, set the stage for the future. Yeah. And then so you still had uh, doing that math. You didn't retire from the military till early 2000s. So you still you did. Did you what did you go on? did you go on to do then cybersecurity specific things in that second in that latter chapter of, of your Navy service? I did. So. so so my first job, I was a network security officer at a software support activity. So basically, and, and again, my introduction there was I met my new CEO on the first day and he said, we just got over a crash and we lost, we didn't have backups of anything. We lost all of our source code on all of our applications. He said, looking and he says, that will never happen again. So that was my, uh, my, my first job. Then I went on and became the CIO of a fairly large command. As a, my next job, my last job though was at the Fleet Information Warfare Center in Norfolk, and I was the I was essentially the the CI operational CISO. Uh, so we were, and again, this was in this was in the late '90s. We were making stuff up as we were going there, but you know, I I created the Navy's first operational red team. We were doing network monitoring of you know ships and and sites globally, Navy ships and sites globally. It was it was an incredibly fun time, you know. But there were no standard protocols that we were making stuff up literally every day. And you know, I had some really really phenomenally smart sailors, and every now and then we were getting in trouble, you know, because we were doing things that today you'd go to jail for. But then again, there were no rules, and we were kind of just feeling yep. our way around. Yeah, Wild West. Uh, you know, I I was in Norfolk. I think uh, for my first years of service, you were there. We overlapped based on the timeline you just threw out. Huh. Uh, at least maybe a year or two. 
that's where I served in Norfolk and Little Creek, uh, respectively. Yeah. But I, I remember, you know, the systems as they were that I saw when I got there. And and uh, yeah, it was it was really, I mean, word perfect uh, and on, on a computer in a couple of rooms. <laughs> no, but all, yeah. Yeah, come a long way. It, it's interesting through that lens. I don't know how you feel. We look at, you know, today, people like, you, you know, look at the woes of cybersecurity. And is it half, is the glass half full or half empty? And we've come a long way. And there's still a long way to go. But my God, you know, it's it's also not, we're, 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 we're making, it's funny. I, people said, why are we not arriving at a more secure place? And my my explanation has been, you know, that the Kennedy and everybody around him have this, you know, the moonshot plan. The problem was relatively static, right? They worked and worked and worked till they solved it and did it. Here we're trying to solve a problem, except the problem is dynamically changing every year. So we haven't arrived yeah. because there's nowhere to arrive to. <laughs> and I, I say this often that, you know, back back then, I, I, I thought I was an expert. I mean, I, I felt like I could legitimately call myself a security expert. Yeah. But today, a CISO today, it's impossible then for them to be an expert. There's just yeah. too much to keep your hand, your fingers on. You know, as you said, it's such a dynamic world we live in, not just the bad guys, and that's bad enough, but the technology is changing so fast. And we have, you know, we have so many technology solutions for different things. It's it's just, it's impossible to understand it all and be an expert in all of it. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I, I hope we circle back to that because I think the CISOs, the CISOs challenge, um, we may need to do, you know, do, do, do a session on that or in one of our live sessions, because it's, it is sort of a, a really interesting area and uh, an evolving area. You retired from service in 2001. Thank you for, you know, a, a stellar. I mean, what is that? Uh, did you do? You did. Uh, 26. Yeah, I was going to say almost three years. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a huge commitment. So thank you uh, uh, for doing that. They kept but, sending me to fun places. I couldn't say no. Well, you know, if you could say that about anything, right? I did, I, did, I kept doing it because I enjoyed doing it. That's a good thing to be able to say. <laughs> so, what happens next uh, when you uh, when you decide to get out? I think you go to a defense, um, one of the defense companies. I went to Raytheon. It was we we boy, you're dredging up some old memories here. Um, we had gone the Navy was going through gone through a program called the Navy Marine Corps Intranet, where basically we were consolidating all technology under one umbrella program. And anyway, Raytheon owned the security piece of this program. And uh, and they hired me to um, to build basically the first global security operations center for the Navy. So I moved to San Diego and, um, and we built this huge facility. So I was hiring people every day back then. And it was, it was fun, but I did that for, for three or for about three years. And then uh, I moved to Colorado, uh, again, with Raytheon, working on a missile defense agency program. Um, and I'd been in, a, in Colorado about a year when, uh, when um, a friend of mine suggested I apply for the, uh, the Colorado CISO job, which they, there wasn't one. And uh, so long story, you know, I, I, I talked with the governor and. I got hired as the first CISO for the state of Colorado, and, and I moved into my new office that um, all I had was a chair, no staff, no budget, no <laughs> mandate, no nothing. Just And I used to joke, I'm like, you know, Governor Governor Owens hired me, but he really didn't know what he was doing, what he was hiring. He was only hiring a CISO because some of his governor friends told him he needed to have one. Yeah. Um, but, he was a great supporter. You know, we had great success. We we wrote the state, the uh, the nation's first state cybersecurity policy codified by the legislature. And it, kind of my first intro into politics. Although, you know, I, I'm not a politician, never have been, don't want to be. But I had to spend a lot of time with with politicians and with legislators. You know, kind of understanding the the nuances of. What does it take to actually craft a piece of legislation and get it through all of the wickets and, you know, get signed by the governor? That was an incredible learning experience there. And they developed some some really good relationships with with uh, with senators and representatives in Colorado and obviously with the governor. So at, at that time, I, I'm curious, how many how many state states had CISOs? Do you have a sense or do you know? Yeah, no, I know. It, 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 probably about 20. 
uh, maybe right around 20. And the only reason I know that is because somehow uh, the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, which is an organization of state CISOs, they had, I'd been in the job, I think a week or two, and we were scheduled to host, Colorado was scheduled to host the annual MSISAC conference in Denver. So I found myself hosting this event after having been in the saddle, I think, for a couple of weeks or a month or something like that. Yeah. So, but I think there are about, about 20 states, maybe maybe not that many, maybe 15, had actually had actual people that called themselves CISOs. But even, even in Colorado, it took a while to build the credibility and support for the program, you know, to be recognized uh, at, at the state level. Yeah, and we're talking 17 years ago. This is not not recent history. So you're you, this is early. I mean, that role uh, in corporations as well and who they report to, it's all emerging at that same time, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, part of my mandate, at least as far as the governor was concerned, was that I was going to kind of be responsible for security in all of the executive branch agencies. And Colorado is, you know, a relatively small state, but we had, I think, 24 different agencies, you know, Everything from Department of Motor Vehicles, Department of Agriculture, Health and Human Services, Department of Corrections, all of these organizations. So I literally had to work with all of the the uh, directors and secretaries there uh, to ensure that they were at least, you know, building a security program that could support what we were doing at the enterprise, at the state enterprise level. It was really early days. You know, it was just. I look back on it now, man, it was just so, it was hard, but it was fun. So times have, have certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's trite to say they've changed. There's a lot of evolution since then, but there may be some things that are still true. You know, if uh, if our listeners, and you know, which is a huge diverse body of listeners, uh, you know, for, for this podcast, but if they were uh, in a first time CISO role, you know, you went on to be a CISO at uh, more places after that. You you went to uh, California, I think, and you were CISO for um, Governor Schwarzenegger, right? Is that that was next? Yeah. So yeah is there, exactly. Advice, if you were going to go back and say, man, oh man, as a first time CISO, is there any sage advice that you think is still applicable today? Either something that you you are glad you did or you wish you had done. Yeah, you know, you might want think I'm going to say something real sexy and technical, but it's about relationships. You know, developing relationships. You know, we cannot do our jobs by ourselves. We need people to help us. We need people to support us. We need people to champion us. And so relationships matter. And you know, I found that by paying attention to people, by helping people, by mentoring people. Was just on a webinar yesterday talking about uh, where I found I had a DHS. I had to develop relationships with our HR department because I kept getting, you know, I would recommend somebody to HR uh, to that we wanted to hire, and next thing I know, these people called me back and said HR called me and said I'm not qualified. So I would have to go to HR and say, wait a minute, you don't understand. There are no real qualifications codified for this role, you know, but I know that this is the person I want. So I only bring that up because, you know, you really need to have relationships matter and you need to have relationships uh, with a, a lot of times with people that you may not think you need to have relationships because it's not just about the technology anymore. I think that is a, a huge, you know, I'm always mining for, for gold in these conversations and that's a big one. It, and you and you sewed it up. I was going to make a point, and you did it. You did it before I got to it, which is it's not about the technology. And um, and there's many very very smart technology based professionals moving into leadership, and they have they struggle to leave the technical jargon and language when talking to some of the other relationships they need to manage, right, or or, or work with, including boards of directors and and senior executives, and that the technology is probably not the thing to focus on at all, right? It's a new set of language in those relationships that you're talking about. Yeah, exactly right. And, you know, and, you know, I think to be a, a good CISO today, you have to have, you're, you have to have a lot of different skills besides being a technologist. Yeah. Um, and the ability to, you know, to work with people, know when you need to go to the mat on things and know when, you know, you, you can say, okay, I'll, I'll fight this battle a different day. Yeah. 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 Makes makes sense. 
So um, you do a couple of CISO jobs, two different states, and then you go to a very unique organization, uh, NERC. Yeah. Well, so you know Mike Asante. Everybody knows Mike Asante. I know Mike. And, you know, Mike, yeah, you know, I had met Mike. I want to say, I don't know, maybe 2007, 2006 sometime, Alan Paler introduced us and, mm-hmm. and we hit it off, you know, we became friends and we kind of, we wrote a couple, wrote, wrote a couple papers together and he, you know, we had talked about doing some work together, working together at some point. And, and uh, so I was, I, it was fact I was at, I was at, uh, in California working uh, from the state at the time, I think it was probably June time frame or so. Coming up on the end of the Schwarzenegger administration, you know, I was already starting to think about, okay, what, what's my next job going to be? Out of the blue, Mike calls me and he says, hey, I'm going to nominate you to take my job at NERC, you know, because I'm going to resign. I have some other things I want to do. And I'm like, Mike, you know, I, I don't know anything about, I know, so I actually, I know a lot about electricity, but I don't know anything about the electricity industry. And he yeah. said, that's all right. You'll figure it out. <laughs> So he put my name in the hat. The next thing I knew, you know, the CEO was out on the West Coast and he flew down to Sacramento. We did an interview in a, uh, in, a in the Hyatt across from the Capitol, uh, and I ended up going to NERC. And, uh, and and I I I thought at the time, you know, this is the best job. I I couldn't have a better job. And I thought literally, I'm just gonna. This is gonna be the last job I ever have in my entire life. But you know, NERC was oh my gosh, what a great you know. At the time, it was it was wonderful. You know, we're, I was doing things that I had never dreamed that I would get the chance to do, uh, working with utilities across the country. Just truly, it was it was my dream job. No, oh, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I I'm glad you you brought up Mike. You know, when you were talking about uh, uh, mid '90s and the word information security, cybersecurity wasn't even a word. You know, Mike and I started uh, Logicape, our first company together. While we were both still on active duty, you know, we started forming it in 1997, and I was in yeah. Norfolk, and he was in D.C. And so we were, you know, I could have bumped into you uh, on the base around that time, or I might think. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's, a small, it's a small world. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, I, I think you know. I, I don't know if, if there's there's certain themes I always sort of try to pull out, and you know, in, in these jobs, uh, obviously they involve involve leading, you know, leading others. You know, anything you know again that comes to mind on teamwork, team building, mentorship is another theme. You know, along this journey, did that play a part for you, being a mentor or a mentee? Yeah, you know, and I tell you, it's still one of the most satisfying things that I do and have done. You know, I say several times a year, you know, somebody that worked for me either in the Navy or NERC or in the state, one of, you know, somewhere, somebody came and, you know, they'll come and say, hey, you know, I just got my first CISO job. And, you know, it's only because you helped me along the way and, you know, you kind of continue to, to mentor me and guide me. Uh, you gave me an opportunity, you know, one young, young guy. I won't say which organization it was because everyone will know who he is, but, um, you know, he wasn't even part of my team. And he came to me and he said, you know, I really want to work for you in your group. And, but I don't know anything. And, but I could, you know, I, so we had a few chats and I said, you know what, I'm going to find a place for you. So I, I found a role for him and I kind of put him side saddle with some people that could really teach him the technical ropes. And, um, uh, he sent me a note last month and he goes, hey, you know, you know, I'm the CEO of my own company, security company now. And, uh, you know, and I literally I owe it all to you. Uh, getting something like that, it kind of makes it all worthwhile um, and it brings it all back, you know, mentoring. And, and, you know, we all have it within us to do that. And it, all it takes is, is caring a little bit and spending a little bit of time with to helping people. You know, couldn't agree with you uh, more. It's 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 essential, right? A, a, le- a helping hand. I've been a mentor and a mentee. You know, at any given time, I've I've been sometimes both at the same time. You know, you know, with different people. It just there, sure. there's always something to learn, and there's always something you can pass on to someone else. And I, I don't know about you, but I have found. I mean, you've been in this community a long time, and I, I I've touched some other communities due to other you know work I've done as an entrepreneur. But the cybersecurity community, I found to be very very willing to you know as a whole 
willing to, to, to lend a helping hand and to, to help build people up. Um, a lot of people with your, you know, with the philosophy you just shared. Yeah, I agree. You know, and I don't, I don't have anything to base it on because this is the only thing I've ever done. But I do find, you know, there are, we are very kind of, we're a community, you know, and um, if you're part of the community, you feel like, you know, some loyalty to that community, you feel, you know, compelled to, to continue to give back to that community. And, and there's a lot of really good people um, that, that do that, you know, and, and I, you know, there's a, there's a small group of us, actually a getting larger group of us, you know, gray beards that we're, you know, we talk about and we think about the next generation of people that are going to coming in behind us and, you know, how we can help them because we still care about the community. Yeah. Any words you would pass on? I mean, that, that group is certainly uh, squarely in CSA's focus, the, the next generation and the generation behind them that need to come in, you know, it's a pipeline. Any, any words of wisdom you, you pass on to that next generation? Well, I mean, I think it's just like I already said, you know, don't think that you're better than other people. Don't think that you don't have time to give back to other people. Relationships matter. Relationships are more important than anything um, for a whole lot of reasons, just to, to make your role better, but also to help make, you know, other people's lives better, make the community better. Yeah, yeah. I, I I definitely agree with you on that. Um, what did you do after uh, after NERC? Um, I think you, you ended up in a very interesting position. <laughs> yeah, you know that was so. Like I said, I I when I went to NERC, I literally I thought this is it. I'm never going to move from here, and because uh, I just man, I just enjoyed it so much. But <laughs> I got a phone call. You know, it was kind of one of these hold for a call from the White House, and I'm like. Yeah, right. You know, who's somebody's yanking my chain here. And uh, anyway, this this guy came on the phone and said, you know, the, we have been looking for somebody to take this job at, at DHS, you know, run cybersecurity for DHS and, you know, and oversee what's happening across the civilian federal government. And your name has got, come up more than anybody else's name. And, and you know, we want you to to we want to offer you this job. You know, I can remember it's like, there's no way I don't want to go back into government. And, you know, I mean, for a whole lot of reasons, you know, one, I was living in D.C. at the time and it was a pretty significant pay cut to go back and work in the in, in the government. But, you know, I called a couple of my 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 mentors, you know, Alan Paler, Mike Gusta, um, and a few of my other friends and I and and had and talked with them and said, you know, should I do this? You know, this is seems crazy to me. And, you know, and everyone said, listen, you really don't have a choice. When when the president calls and, and makes you a job offer like this, it's like you can't say no. And so anyway, I took the job and, you know, it, it again, once again kind of changed the trajectory trajectory of my life because it gave me a uh, a podium that you know, this farm boy from Northern California, I never, ever, ever thought that I would, would be sitting in. Um, but I was really able to influence a lot uh, from my role at, uh, at DHS. And um, so, you know, one of, uh, one of my, I, I had two primary missions. One was working with the um, security teams and CISOs, and all of the civilian federal agencies, you know, these, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and um and you know we were building our own our own program at dhs for monitoring you know government networks and, and all kinds of stuff but so that was that was really only half of my job the other half of my job was was working with the 16 critical infrastructures of the nation so i was i spent a lot of time with the electricity industry from my government role working with oil and gas and and telcos and and health services and you know all of the it was so and, and by the way that was that was much more enjoyable than my job working with with government agencies but yeah i mean so and, and it's still a few people know the story it was you know i was negotiating with, with dhs at the time and, and i really didn't want to leave NERC. and we were in fact we were just doing the first, not GRIDX, the grid, grid Security Conference that was in, in D.C. 
and I had been kind of holding off, holding the government off. And, and they called me one morning and says, listen, we need an answer. You know, are you, are you interested in this or not? And uh, I can remember having a conversation with, with my CEO at NERC at the time that morning saying, hey, I'm leaving. And he's like, what do you mean you're leaving? You're, we're having a conference. I mean, there's like thousands and hundreds of people here, not thousands. And I said, well, I, I, I I have to do this, you know, I can't not do this. And uh, so anyway, yeah, that was, it was, it was just kind of a, it was a weird time. I just thought of something sort of pattern wise. What, um, was there, had there been a CISO in California before you? Uh, no, I was the first CISO. I was the first CISO in Colorado, the first CISO in California and the first deputy undersecretary for cybersecurity. That's what I thought. So I'm wondering there, you know, as many jobs are emerging, uh, there's still industries creating first time security leaders, or maybe they're, maybe elevated leaders, maybe they had sort of a manager of security, but this idea of board reporting, executives, true chief level, that's still emerging. That's still, some companies don't have it yet and they're inventing that. So people's opportunity to be in a position for the first time is still happening. You were doing it a while ago, being, you know, being in this sort of a senior leadership position, reporting to, you know, reporting to, to top, uh, top principal, uh, you know, executives. Any any sort of reminiscence or advice there? Like if you're going to be in a first time a first time position, I mean, you're not many people can say they've done done it in such high profile first time positions as you have. Yeah, well, you know, this is this is actually a topic of conversation amongst um, amongst us experienced guys, and that is because there are so many, you know, the CISO role is growing um, so in so many places. A lot of people are taking CISO jobs that are probably not qualified for them. Uh, that are probably not not that they wouldn't be, but they're 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 getting into these roles before they you know they skin their elbows and their knees a few times, and unfortunately they don't last long. And you know they they find out their their board finds out that you know the board's not happy, the CIO, CEO's not happy, and it's only it's because you know they're hiring people. Um, that are really that really don't have the kind of experience. Now, you know, everybody has to see, be a CISO for the first time. I get it. But some people are are ending in these really big jobs who have never really done it, or they may be a technologist that have never had to do budgeting, never had to talk to the board and do all of those you know mundane administrative kind of things that are really important to success for a CISO. So. A lot of great jobs out there today that I, you know, and, and you know, this is there's not a, a right answer to it because people need organizations need people to fit into those jobs, but just like there's not enough technologists today, there's not enough experienced CISOs either. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. It's not it's not a function of just people accepting jobs they shouldn't take. There's not enough people to there's not enough qualified people to fill those positions, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I mean, have- it's just like. I mean, it's just like, you know, I don't want to be a CISO anymore, but I probably get, you know, once or twice a month, I can get, I get inbounds, you know, looking for somebody to, to do a job. And, and, and they're very specific because they're, um, they're looking for experience. So I'm, you know, I point a lot of my friends, a lot of people that I, you know, a lot of first timers that I think, you know, this person's ready to be a CISO. Um, they've, They've done all the right things. They've been preparing their career to do this. So, you know, I, man, I, I do whatever I can to make sure that good people can get into these roles. What, what, what would you give advice uh, as far as someone prepping, you know, if they're desiring to be one in one of these senior roles and they aren't there yet, what kinds of things can they work on? And clearly relationship skills, you, you've brought that theme more than once. So that's part of it. I know. Yeah. You kind of, you got to work on that. If that's a if that's a tough air, area for you, surviving in those top positions, it is going to be about communication. You know, uh, you you know, you're going to have to you have to be a good communicator, right? I mean, that that's going to be required. Yeah. You have to work yeah. On that. Anything else? I, you know, I I think you know this this covers a lot of waterfront uh, with this statement, but you really just need to be able to look at the big picture. You know, um, security, and and I have been as guilty of this as anybody in the world. We often are very myopic in looking at the world. You know, everything revolves around security. And, you know, it wasn't until I took my first really big job 
um, the more I realized, holy cow, you know, people really don't care about security farther than it's a function for this business to survive. So you really need to be able to look at the big picture of an organization. You know, I, I, in fact, I, I, I wrote an article about this last year. Uh, I was invited by a friend of mine um, to come and brief his board of directors at a board meeting on the cyber threat. So I gave my little pitch and said, you know, here's what the bad guys are doing. Here's who they are. And then uh, it, was, it was his turn to do his actual present, his actual update to the board on, on security and, and get all of his, his standard kind of metrics. And some are good and some are not good. But um, one of the board members asked him, I don't, I don't remember what the question was, but it was it was not a it was not a, a CISO related question. It was a business related question, and um, the CISO he he literally kind of he you know he froze up and he didn't know how to answer. And and of course you know board members are smart people, and you know and, and they have real fiduciary responsibility. So you know they're kind of like a shark. And they saw a weakness. This guy saw a weakness. And he started asking questions, asking the CISO questions that he had no clue about. And they were all business related. And finally, and, and the, the whole reason for the story, the last thing the board member said was, you really don't know how this business makes money, do you? And, uh, oh, oh, oh. and he, he just sat there, you know, like, with a stunned look on his face. And of course, you know, I'm moving as far away from him as I can in case there's shrapnel blow back, you know, <laughs> that I don't want to get hit with. Um, but, you know, but but that's, I, so I, you know, to answer your question, CISOs need to look at the big picture. It doesn't matter if you're in a government organization or a private sector organization. What does this government, what does this organization do to generate revenue? Or why do, you know, why are taxpayers paying for this, for this organization? And, Security is, unless you're a security company, security is not the reason. Uh, security is a supporting reason why this company is in business. And, and CISOs need to understand that. Wow. I, I think that was, uh, we just mined a big a big hunk of gold ore there. Um, that That's huge. And the way you framed it, I think, is is, is pretty big. You know, a, a case study of how, how it went down when someone wasn't prepared. That learning business language and learning the, not just business language like you said learning the business that you're in or, or you're that you're going to be in if you're going to oh take it. because you're right the purpose of the business yeah. is whatever that core the function is if it's to produce electricity that's clearly the business they're in and and you're right i i also have seen security uh very very intelligent smart security people not able to not able to parse that you know what's the real purpose here and, and, and an example i think of in terms of a uh, of a, a really cool presentation uh, that that I saw a large uh, you know a large um, OEM executive give around that if we can attenuate all these turbines with you know data from our data like you know so back data going two ways you know not just data out but data back it's this many millions of dollars at the bottom line per plant this many plants you know, huge numbers millions and millions of dollars and I remember after that lecture there were some pure really sharp security people all up in arms that it was crazy that there was going to be this connection to the outside world. You know, this is some years ago. Uh, you know, <laughs> wrong. And I thought what you just said, I mean, in my head, I thought you didn't listen. It, there's so many millions at stake. We need to be talking about how to architect this, not don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember back when I was a CISO for the state of California, every a couple of times a year, I would get all of the department and agency CISOs together. And we we're just kind of, you know, sure see how we could help each other. But I remember talking, um, and, you know, this was probably 2011, no, like maybe 2009. Anyway, I gave, I remember giving, it was giving a talk and, and I said, hey, you know, this cloud thing out there, we don't know a lot about it right now, but this is going to be a big deal and we need to pay attention to this. A couple of these CISOs came, literally came running up to me after the after the event and saying, you know, something to the to the effect of over my dead body, will I ever put my data in an organization that I don't manage? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, I think, you know, we need to pay attention to this. I don't know what it looks like. And so, I, you know, I think you know, when we look at the way technology has changed and oh, my gosh, it's just it's mind blowing. 
Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to predict right now, I think companies like Amazon are going to get into cloud services. Oh, wait. I thought they were a book company. <laughs> You're right. I mean, um, that's another great, it's a great example, right? Of, of, of be aware of what's going on, understand the context. And, and, and so, yeah, you're going to move from potentially people to move into these positions are going to move from technology, maybe focused uh, career paths to, to business career paths, right? That's the CISO's opportunity yep. and challenge. Yep, exactly right. So, you know, you've got in your, you know, even since that role, you've got advisory board and, you know, which you're currently advisor to a number of entities uh, and roles in different things. And now you're at Alert Enterprise uh, and you are the CSO there. And and you were an advisory board there before you were the CSO there. So there's, let's talk just a little bit about advisory board roles and, it, and being, you know, what the opportunities there are. I, I know, in fact, I've reached out uh, by uh, somebody who's on the global advisory board of CSA and he said, hey, I'd like to do maybe some of this advisory board work. And he's a, a prominent executive at a big company and he hasn't done advisory board work. So there might be people listening to this Mark, that are that are um, senior and they're interested in advisory board work, but they've never done it. How do they do it? And, and what what's entailed? What does that mean? Well, that boy, tell you what, I, we could give a whole lecture on this. And and yeah, I, you know, sure. I don't consider my, I don't give consider myself an expert on many things, but you know, I've probably been on I don't know, I've probably been on twenty five or thirty advisory boards over the last decade, yeah. and and really kind of the expectations have evolved over that time. And I think the first first couple of advisory boards on people simply wanted access to my Rolodex. You know, they wanted access and they wanted introductions. So I kind of evolved with that. And I have kind of my standard uh, set of questions and my standard things that I put in play when I uh, agreed to do an advisory board. And, you know, I, and so I think there's a lot of things that people want you to do, but when you're on an advisory board, you have to be kind of careful, you know, because it's based on, typically it's based on your reputation and your ability to help that company. If you spread that too thin or you you share the same information too often, you dilute your value and you dilute your credibility. So it, and one thing that I found in, in, in this 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 didn't happen with, with Alert Enterprise, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but I think after a while, I just started, I would, I would go to, and by the way, I, I mentor people that, on this all the time. If, if there was a technology or a company that I was really interested in, I would, I would meet with the CEO or the CTO. I would try to find out a little bit more about it. And then, and then I would just say, Hey, you know, you need me on your advisory board. I can help you. Um, and, and it's, it's you know being proactive like that. It's amazing how successful I've been on getting on good advisory boards. Now, you know, I get I get probably once or twice a week somebody uh, a company will call me and want me to be on an advisor board. And you know yeah. at, at this point, I am very very discreet and and selective about you know where I go because you know there is only a certain number of hours in the day and yeah. and. Um, and we, whether we like it or not, you know, the, the statistics still speak for themselves that, you know, most startups don't make it. And and, and now I am on the advisory board of a, of a couple of public companies as well. And those we have less to worry about. But, you know, but startups simply they're trying to grow revenue and, you know, they're looking for people that can help them to do that. And a lot of them simply, you know, they may offer you a lot of equity, but if that company doesn't make it, then spending your time for nothing yeah yeah no i uh started starting out as an entrepreneur in 1997 i can attest to what you just shared and yeah it's a tough it's a tough exciting road but a lot of a lot of companies uh and even good, but good, fun. good products don't make it yeah yeah but really fun i mean you know I, in fact you know to me it's one of the funnest things i do now because you know because i am i'm no longer a cso but it's the one thing that keeps my fingers in the technology. It keeps me very engaged with the technology. Um, and of course, you know, I'm always trying to see where the overlaps are between different companies and try to keep myself you know, as diverse as possible. Yeah. Yeah. No, it makes, makes total sense. I, I, I'm wondering about us doing a session on this topic because it's, it's, it does come up. People are like, how to do it, how to do it right, how to screen, how, you know, it's all these things you sort of touched on. We could do a whole, a whole talk on that. 
with the time we've got left, um, what are two or three things you would tell younger Mark Weatherford if you were sitting down uh, or early, much, much earlier in your career path? You know, anything you, you, you would sit down that you haven't. I mean, you've shared some stuff you would probably tell that person, your younger self now. But anything else come to mind that you would share with the younger Mark? Yeah, I would. You know, I know it's a cliche, but don't sweat the small stuff. You know, there, you know, it, when you go, when you look at the things that happen every day in the life of CISO, most of it is small stuff. And if you can really get distracted by by these piles of small stuff stacking up, when reality, it's, you know, it, it's small stuff. Um, and, and I think going right along with that, and that is, and I'm still guilty of this today, is my imagination goes crazy. And I'm always thinking, oh, my God, you know, this this is literally the end of the world. Reality is it's not usually the end of the world. Um, your imagination is is uh, uh, probably your worst enemy when you start thinking about all the bad things that can happen. And I think, you know, the, the last one is this is not contrary to my first one, just with the small stuff. But it's pay attention to small details. Little things matter sometimes. And that doesn't mean small stuff. That means, you know, little details matter. And how you... Can you give an example of that? Because that I get that and I'm thinking different things. But I'm curious, just a, an example for people who might be listening. Like, what does he mean by that? Well, it's like, I, I, I won't say Log4j is an example. But... You know, Log4j is an example of a supply chain kind of a problem. And, you know, I can remember working. In fact, I was on the advisory board of a company that was in the supply chain space. And I can remember thinking, you know, this supply chain thing could really, you know, two or three years ago, nobody in the security space was talking about supply chain. I mean, it was always there. But I started saying, you know what, this is a kind of a little detail right now that most people aren't thinking about that could really be hor- horrible. And when you were thinking about another one that has kind of been, I would call it a small detail, we for the longest time worried about um, the open source code that we're developing everything on today. And, you know, open source, it's a, it's a little detail in the big scheme of how you're building your infrastructure. But when you, when you actually start pulling it apart, and we find that open source is actually more ubiquitous than anybody ever imagined. And then, then you start following the trail down, you know, software bill of materials and understanding what the assets look like. I, I don't know if that's, that's probably a horrible example of a small detail, but, but I think, you know, just paying attention and trying to discern, you know, what my am, and you know, maybe some of this goes back to my, again, back to my Navy days when I was looking at intelligence stuff, and I'm thinking, you know, there's little details here that a, a certain bad actor may be doing the certain same things all the time, and you're thinking, you know, that could lead to something bigger down the road. So those small details, just paying attention to them, you know, and not all small details are important, but but monitoring that landscape to think about, you know, where some of these things may end up, where they may go. You know, instantly I'm listening to you. I'm thinking some of those details are written by others and are consumable that you can consume them by reading. How much reading do you do? Oh my gosh. (laughs) Well, I easily do three to four hours every day. I mean, it's kind of how I start my day. You know, I, I look at my email and then I start reading through the blogs and the subscriptions that I have um, to different things um, and easily three or four hours a day. And then if one of my customers wants me to read something, I mean, I had a, a customer yesterday sent me a 54 page document that said, Hey, can you figure out if there's anything in here relevant for us? And so, you know, and, yeah. and if they weren't paying me, I would say no, but, and, and by the way, going back to one of the earlier things, you know, when we talk about about spending your time wisely, you know, there's always more work to do than you have time to do. And people will take advantage of that time if you let them. So, you know, there's nothing better in the world than free expertise. Uh, and people will take advantage of that if you let them. Um, and, and I tell people now, you know, people send me a, a 20 page document because they want my opinion on it. 20 page document, that's a, that's a, an hour of 
just to read it and digest it and think about yeah. commenting on it. That, that, that's time that's, uh, that I can be spending on doing something for one of my customers or for, you know, for my own organization. So, you know, maybe add that to, you know, the tell other younger people to think about them. That's manage your time well and don't let people take advantage of your time. Yeah, yeah. Sage, that's also sage, uh, sage advice. This has been awesome, Mark. You've had, uh, have had, and are having still such an, an amazing and interesting career path. And um, uh, you know, I, I, I know that other people would 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 feel this way as well. But it's it's due to people like you that we've got some hope. You know, there's we need we need people to be doing what you're doing. You know, focused on this issue in various places: private sector, public sector, startups, mature companies. They're all part of an ecosystem, right? And we need we need all that to function in the cybersecurity dimension, at least function better than it does. For sure. Yeah. Well, we're at my favorite part of the show, which is where I, I, I don't want to say I steal, but I, I borrow something from another show, but they borrowed it from another show and it's called the, the Pivot questionnaire. And it was used uh, for many, many years. It may still be, I haven't seen it recently, but it was, uh, there was a television show called inside the actor studio. Uh, and James Lipton was the host for decades before he, uh, before he passed on. And James Lipton used, he ended his show, which was interviewing famous actors and actresses uh, on the stage at, at the drama school where he was the dean. And um, he used this question from a French show, that, and it's called the Pivot Questionnaire. So if you're ready, we'll uh, we'll end with that. Sure, go ahead. All right. What is your favorite word? Oh, my gosh. You know, this is going to sound weird, but um, I like the word lechuga. It's lettuce in Spanish. And it's just, it doesn't mean anything, but it's just, I like saying that word, lechuga. Lechuga. What is your least favorite word? What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, I find a good crisis is always motivating. Um, you know, a lot of people hate them, and I won't say I look forward to them by any means. But, you know, when you have a crisis, it kind of is an opportunity to one for the team to rally, but also to kind of, uh, you know, show that that the money that people have been spending on this security stuff is actually of value to them. What turns you off? Negative people, people that say we can't do that or people that um, just constantly complain. Um, yeah, nothing worse than, than a chronic complainer. What is your favorite curse word? Let's skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Man, I love the na noise of nature, uh, the quiet of nature. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, I hate city traffic and sirens. You know, being on a, on a conference call or a Zoom call and somebody is sitting in downtown Washington, D.C., there's a constant just drone of, of traffic and sirens that just, I hate that. Hate it. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, I am attempting to be a rancher. Um, I'm going to raise cattle. Well, what profession would you like to not do? <laughs> well, uh, one, it, one of the, or my early jobs um, uh, in high school, when I wasn't working on the farm or the ranch or doing that, I, was, I worked at a cemetery and, uh, and I dug graves. Um, and that's something I would not want to do ever again. <laughs> and if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <laughs> I think I'd like him to say, you know, good. We're glad to see you, but we didn't think you were going to make it. <laughs> All right. Well, Mark Weatherford, CSO at Alert Enterprise, the Chief Strategy Officer at the National Cybersecurity Center, uh, an advisory board member and fellow to CSA. Thank you for your service to the community and to our association and uh, uh, to our country. And I uh, thank you for being here today and spending the time, uh, you know, with with me. And and I hope. People enjoy this as much as I did. Thanks, Derek. Happy to be here. It was a good time. All right. Take care and be well. Bye-bye.